add. And then what I'm going to do is pause it. Father on my father's side was a member of United Rubber Workers Local 1 off of the Jefferson Avenue plant. And on my mother's side were seven generations of the United Mine Workers of America who were founding members. So this is this is a, the, some of these stories were told to me as a kid, especially around Henry Ford. Um, uh, and it's been um, it's been eye opening to return to the this story, especially in the context of the myths that we tell ourselves about it and uh, the way Ypsilanti remembers it. Ypsilanti is celebrating its uh, bicentennial anniversary and Willow Run will be a big part of that story. And I am afraid that what you're looking at right here, Willow Run, a lesson America still ignores, will still be <laughs> ignored as we go forward. Um, I think that one of the one of the issues about talking about Willow Run is that people are quite personally invested in their own family stories that might have come up here uh, to work at Willow Run or come, you know, uh, were a part of that world, lived in Willow Lodge, lived in the federal housing. And so people are very invested in the story and for good reason. Uh, people did amazing things and, and, and the most amazing thing that they did was build the UAW. Uh, um, but I think that there are a lot of myths about Willow Run. And if you read anything from the time rather than after it, you know, when we're building those myths, Willow Run was, will it run? <laughs> Willow Run was a disaster. Uh, and for the union movement, it was a symbol of what was wrong, both in how specifically Henry Ford, but the larger auto industries dealt with uh, their employees and also the lack of uh, um, uh, support, the lack of aid, the lack of resources for those workers from local, federal, and municipal governments. So one of the things that I hope we take away from this is that while today we revere the Willow Run workers and the Rosies, and they were the people who fought and won the war for us at the home front, in fact, at the time, those people were utterly expendable and treated as such uh, uh, by uh, uh, the Henry Ford, by the Ford Company, by the UAW, <laughs> by local governments. Uh, and, and they knew that they were being uh, uh, expended. And so I think to really honor uh, the sacrifices and what people were able to achieve under extraordinary conditions, that we need to tell the truth about what they faced. Otherwise, we're also not gonna understand large parts of our community, including why Willow Run is what it is today. Okay, so Willow Run, a lesson America still ignores, and that is still true. To be able to tell this story, though, we're going to have to do a little background, because the UAW is coming into a place, right, that has an old, has a history of, of working class a working class history. It has a history of the labor movement. It has uh, quite a history of um, of industry. And most importantly, in some ways for our story, Ypsilanti, you know, around 1900, is about uh, 15 to 20 percent African-American. Michigan, this is before we think of as the Great Migration. Michigan in this period will be far less than 1 percent African-American. Ann Arbor will be about 3%, Detroit just hovering around 1%. So Ypsilanti is the most black city. Now, obviously there are more people, black people in Detroit than in Ypsilanti, but as a percentage of the population, Ypsilanti is the most black city between the Civil War and World War I in the state of Michigan. And that means that the great migration is reversed in Ypsilanti. So we often think of the Great Migration as people fleeing from Jim Crow, fleeing from sharecropping, tenant, pharmacy, pharmacy, uh, tenant farming, to come north to work in the uh, uh, industries of the Great Lakes uh, and the East Coast. And you have to reverse that for Ypsilanti. There is an existing Black population here, so heavy industry moves to Ypsilanti to take advantage of that Black working class population. And specifically, and people who know the history of the auto industry will know that black men uh, traditionally worked in foundries. 
Uh, and so Ypsilanti has a couple of very early foundries. In fact, where the Ford factory is today on I-94, that used to be U.S. Press Steel. And where the Corner Brewery is today, that used to be Central Specialty. Both were uh, iron foundries, especially at the beginning, the early iron foundries. And very interestingly, both of those, at least uh, for the period we're going to be talking about, were majority black workers, and both of them became UAW CIO uh, uh, locals before Henry Ford uh, uh, was broken in April uh, 1941. So, so Ypsilanti's black population is going to help define this story on a number of different uh, ways. So labor before Rosie the Riveter. And, you know, we often think that um, uh, women entered the workforce the industrial workforce in in during World War One and then later in World War Two, but of course the very first industrial revolution in the United States is in the textile industry, uh, um, uh, uh, fueled by the absolute explosion and expansion of slave power and cotton growing, uh, and then also fueled by migrants, um, uh, uh, people who didn't come here as previous migrants. Uh, to um, sort of uh, make their way and own property and stuff like that. They came here to work in somebody else's factory, right? A different kind of migration. And so in Ypsilanti, the largest single employers, now most people we would consider in working class employment would be men, but the largest single employers in Ypsilanti, uh, almost all through the 19th century, are going to be mills employing women. Uh, and and so Ypsilanti's industrial revolution begins where Frog Island is and, you know, where the parks are on 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 the river there, fueled by the power of the water on the rivers. And they are going to be um, uh, and here you can actually see some of the women here. You weren't allowed to talk. I mean, it was an extremely oppressive uh, uh, environment. And you can imagine um, that uh, uh, um, a, a kind of a sexual violence or a sexual assault w w was pretty commonplace. Uh, I think we would be lying if we didn't think that were the case. We certainly know that in Kalamazoo, in this period, women went on strike specifically against sexual assault in the early 1900s at mills, just like happened in Ypsilanti. Now, Ypsilanti does not get, Ypsilanti has a very strong craft union movement. So um, the carpenters are very strong here. The molders are very strong. The, um, so artisans, but it is a craft union is by its necessity only organizing the people of a certain craft, right? It is by necessity exclusive, not inclusive, right? And so many people who were who were considered non unskilled were not included in any notion of unionism here in, in Ypsilanti. And that includes uh, the women workers. Now, there were certainly, people have, have heard of the uh, Ladies Garment Workers Union, uh, the Algamated Clothing Workers. These were very important unions. They were largely immigrant women-led, and, and they led um, uprisings uh, in Chicago, in New York around 1909, 1910. Many of them were Jewish women. Um, and many of them came to organize uh, Michigan. The ILGWU certainly came to Michigan to organize. Ypsilanti was was very hard nut to crack. It was an open shop town. It was an open shop town. So um, uh, you can see, though, on this top right, there was quite a ripple of excitement in the desk, dress factory last Monday where some 25 girls in the pinky department went on a strike upon refusal of an increase of 25% in their wages, which they demanded their places were filled by new girls, right? So they didn't have a union, but still they went on strike. And we see lots and lots of that kind of ad hoc labor activity outside of the union movement. And, and it's going to be largely women and unskilled workers who are going to engage in that. Um, again, we get a large foundry. I think it's also important to remember that much of our labor uh, in this period is coerced labor. It is not free labor, even though we're talking well after slavery. So Jackson Prison, right? I mean, the prison was almost built as a labor <laughs> labor hiring out center. Uh, it was literally placed where it was to take advantage of rail there so that the prisoners could work 
in 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 prison factories. And uh, Highway 12, Michigan Avenue, is built by prison labor and also uh, by Mexican labor uh, in the mid 1910s. And uh, Ypsilanti, although black people could, it was not a sundown town for black people. Ypsilanti was a sundown town for those Mexican laborers who had to live, uh, who had to have their camps on the outskirts of town. One thing that's very different uh, from Ypsilanti, from other areas, and it, again, it goes back to Ypsilanti's Black population, is we get an extraordinarily limited foreign immigration at the time when you see massive foreign immigration. So around 1900, Detroit will be 40% foreign-born. Ypsilanti will be 8% foreign-born, and they will all be from Canada, right? Um, and one of the reasons for that is the work that immigrants were coming in and doing and being employed at in Ypsilanti, black people were here. And so Ypsilanti is a kind of nativist community. It's black and white. The, the last big wave of European immigration to Ypsilanti was in the 1850s and it was the Germans and they lived on the east side of Ipsy. And Ipsy is to this day still called Dutch or the east side is still called Dutch town where the German Lutheran church is to this day. Uh, east side of Ypsilanti was German and Democratic voting uh, and had saloons. The west side of Ypsilanti was uh, very um, uh, British Isles and had no saloons. And if you notice where all the churches are in Ypsilanti, they're all on the west side, not the east side. There's a real class division between east and west Ypsilanti. Now, Black people historically by this time will be living on the west side of Ypsilanti, but also I think it's important to remember that Black people at this point are voting Republican, uh, almost to a person, and the west side is Republican. And there is something like Reconstruction here with Black people uh, 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 participating at very high levels in the Republican Party until all of that collapses with Jim Crow. So Ypsilanti looks different even than in Ann Arbor, which will have many different nationalities. You would hear many different languages. Here, the Germans continued to speak German generation after generation after generation, but, but it was very much a, a nativist town. Um, Otto develops very early in Ypsilanti. We are in Henry Ford's backyard, but there's other people, the Dodge, but there's many different concerns, and they're very small concerns. These are these are what you might call startups now, right? Um, and there are many uh, of those in Ypsilanti. And so that means when Henry Ford wants to try to break into Ypsilanti, which he considers kind of his backyard, he has to compete with his competitors here who have been working here for a while. So it takes Ford about 10 years between 1919 and 1929 to buy Ypsilanti politicians and land enough to where he can come in here. Uh, we will we will be sparing Henry Ford uh, nothing in this presentation, I'm afraid. Um, and so Henry Ford, one of the things he does is he declares one of the lower part of he declares the Huron River, he gets action, he doesn't declare it, he gets the Michigan state government to declare the lower Huron River a disaster area. Why? Because he's about to flood it. <laughs> right? So before he floods it, to be able to remove people from it, which is the richest bottom, it's where Ford Lake is now, that's what Ford Lake is. It's the richest bottom land in Detroit or in, in Washtenaw County, and he wants to create a dam there to power his new factory that he's going to build on the site of the old U.S. press steel. And this is going to be one of Ford's um, uh, uh, um, village factories. And he had this totally reactionary utopian idea that farmers would farm during the farm season and come in and work and build cars in the other season. And somehow there was going to be this balance between you could always still be a farmer and have your hands in the soil while you were working for Henry Ford. That didn't work out, obviously. Um, but so this was one of those village uh, uh, industries of Henry Ford. No black people would be working at that. It is important to remember that unlike the other big auto companies, Henry Ford does hire and relatively early black people into the Ford system. Now, I think we need to stress it is into a segregated Ford system. It's not like black folks are working right next to white folks in the tool and die industry in 1932 or the tool and die department, right? It's, it's it, there are people, black people are confined to uh, uh, certain jobs. 
in certain factories and most of Ford factories would have been no-go areas for and certainly the village industries no-go areas for black people so we don't see black people even though there's many black workers here we don't see black people working at a Ford plant in Ypsilanti until 1943 when the federal government forces Ford to hire black people so uh, so by 1929, Henry Ford has built his political power base here. Uh, uh, Ypsilanti becomes the home of people like Harry Bennett. Up on Getty's Avenue becomes a, 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 a retreat for many Ford executives. They feel comfortable here. They own the township government. They own the city government. Um, they get what they want. Um, uh one of the interesting things about Ypsilanti is one of the ways that they got Ford and other people to come here is unlike Ann Arbor, because they, they they didn't have the resources and couldn't get other people in, Ypsilanti, and it still has today, public utilities, because they wanted to create a situation, basically these public utilities were created to induce industry to come to Ypsilanti. They weren't there to heat the homes of Ypsilantians. But what they did mean is that uh, uh, we have more democratic control over our utilities. It was harder to turn people off during the Depression. And most importantly for our story, because it is city owned and black people have a real social weight and power in the city, the demand for black employment is you're able to do that. So any of the city owned gas plants, the building of the water tower would have black employment in it, of, of black Ypsilantians. If that were in private hands, that wouldn't have happened. So it, 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 you know, and I still meet people to this day who are quite proud that their great grandfather helped to build the water tower. Um, the local government, uh, uh, because Henry Ford is here, just like a few years ago with with uh, the health care initiative, many uh, state governments turned down actual money because they were ideologically opposed to expanding Medicare or whatever. Washtenaw County was one of those counties that refused much federal funding. Uh, you know, the W. We don't see a lot of those wonderful WPA murals in Washtenaw County. We don't. I think we got the Tridge <laughs> in in Frog Island. So we didn't get a lot out of 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 that until a little bit later. And that is again a political decision. Uh, the unions here are virtually non-existent, but we'll, we'll go into that. So the spirit of 37, and the many people will know, uh, um, I hear a lot of talk today because of the auto strike about what happened in Flint. And Flint, I mean, there are other, Akron in 1936 has a series of sit-down strikes. Sit-down strikes are not new, but the scale of it and the disruption caused in Flint to the world's largest private corporation at the time, they shut down the Amazon at, of the time, right? That's what they did. Or even more than Amazon doesn't produce anything. They shut down the thing that produced stuff, right? And, um, and that was a profound shifting moment because people who had never been a part of the union movement were becoming part of the union movement because what the CIO was, which was so different than what the craft unions of the AFL was, is the craft unions are exclusive. The industrial unions of the CIO are inclusive. We want all of you in the factory in this common union. We want black people in this union. We want women. We don't care if you're skilled or not. We are an industrial union. We are not a craft union. And that, mean that, that means that the labor movement literally changed complexion. Right. Uh, and changed gender. Uh, and one of the remarkable things you will notice in the aftermath of the Flint sent down strikes, in part because of what the women did at Flint, but in part just generally the impulse that that ha had aroused was the number of women in the in the lowest sort of strata of work, working in department stores and working at restaurants occupying their places of employment. They found power in what the women did in Flint and brought it into their own workplace. So the very first time we see a sit down strike and the UAW finally break Republican Ford controlled Washtenaw County. Now there were UAW company unions, the old AFL UAW. The UAW CIO is something different. And so uh, 
if anybody knows Ann Arbor, where the YMCA today is, that was the American Brooch plant, and that was the first sit down here in Ipsil, uh, uh, in Washington County, and that that goes. So here you see CIO employees at the hospital, um, uh, at the gas company. So not yet Ford, because Ford, unlike everybody, at Ford is the last one. I mean, Ford literally has to have the gun of World War II put to his head by the federal government before he will sign a union contract. But 37 breaks things open. We get a small break in in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor with this and with a couple of the smaller, but the big plants, the big employers. And right now, you know, U.S. Press Steel, Ford, I mean, we're talking about maybe 10,000 industrial workers in eastern Washington County at that time. In World War II, we're going to be talking about 100,000, so it's going to change dramatically. Uh, but that's the first win for the CIO. Now, Ford is the key to this story um, because Ford is, like I said, GM and Chrysler, they have parts suppliers here and stuff like that, but they don't have big – this is Ford country. And um, GM and Chrysler are largely beaten in the wave of sit-down strikes in the uh, uh, spring into summer of 1937. Uh, but Ford is not. Ford, it will take another four years to do. And one of the issues at Ford, which is not an issue at Chrysler and GM and will become the central kind of, the, the central character of what we're about to see is at Chrysler and GM, the UAW could organize all of those workers, even on a racist basis, right? They, they didn't have to raise anti-racist demands. They didn't have to raise equality demands. They didn't have to say, you're now going to have to work next to, because the hiring at those places, again, the UAW doesn't do the hiring. The hiring is being done by the companies and they have a racist hiring policy. Right. And so the UAW is naturally organizing a segregated workforce. Right. Now, Ford is very different because Ford ha is the only place that will uh, uh, hire of the big three that will hire black people. And so and it, it, it does mean then that that job, I mean, if you get fired from Ford do you, and you're black, do you go to GM? Do you go to Chrysler? I mean, you're out of a job. Right. You're out of a job. So. The, the, the issue around um, taking Black issues seriously was extremely important. You could not win at Ford unless you put the concerns of Black workers front and center. And that required or, uh, Black organizers to do that. You had to get, and here we, you'll see some of them here. Um, uh, I'm going to forget his name off. The, somebody on this call knows his name right down here. Um, uh, and so you basically had to offer black workers at Ford two things. One, more than Ford could ever offer, right? Uh, so you, you, you'd have to go, we're not, you're, you're, you just can't work here. You have to have equality here, right? And you have to have power in the union. And then the second thing is because the consequences were so severe to black workers at Ford, if they lost, you got to win. <laughs> you must win, right? Otherwise, we you might be able to get a job again. We won't be able to get a job again. So, so it changes the character of what the UAW is doing. The UAW and Ford and the organizers at Ford become, in effect, the most important civil rights organization in Michigan history. Local 600 of the Rouge is the when when when. When um, uh, um, Nelson Mandela was re released from Robben Island and came to Detroit, one of the one of the places that was so supportive of of of, of the struggle in South Africa, he he visited UAW Local 600 because UAW Local 600 bucked the anti-communism of the UAW in the 80s to demand uh, a boycott of South Africa. Right. And, and, and forced the issue within the UAW. And and that wouldn't have happened if what we're looking at in the 40s didn't happen. Right. This that it brought black people to political and social power in Michigan for the very first first time. Now, up against Henry, uh, up against what you're facing is this man right here. 
His name is Harry Bennett. He lived up on Gettys Avenue. He's an actual killer of workers. In 1932, at the Ford Hunger March, he fired a machine gun into a crowd of people protesting for bread. Five people were killed that day. I don't know which of his bullets hit it, but he was a boxer and a gangster. And he is head. This is the man who Henry Ford chooses to be head of human relations at Willow Run. So you can imagine what Willow Run is going to be run like if this man is going to be, uh, I mean, I just look at his face and I need to move on. Okay, so um, there is historic segregation in Ypsilanti. Uh, that the great gains that were won after the Civil War were reversed, right? And I don't have time to go into all of this, but it is not like one of the issues is that Ypsilanti, because of the weight of its black population, meaning the numbers in the city, you know, if you if you were a racist council, city council in Eaton Rapids and you wanted to segregate your black community, but there were only three families. Right. You're not going to build separate institutions for them. It doesn't it doesn't make Segre There's not en enough weight to segregate people. In Ypsilanti, the opposite is true, right? You can create a separate institution for every institution necessary for society in Ypsilanti. And in fact, that's what happens. So the area uh, of Monroe Street and Harriet Street, kind of where you get off and on, I-94 uh, I today was a Black business district that was raised during urban renewal. There was even a Black um, uh, a, a stop on the interurban on the south side. Uh, so we had that kind of level of segregation. Now, segregation is illegal in Michigan under the 1886 Civil Rights Act, and you're not supposed to have segregated schools. Of course, there were segregated schools. But to give you a sense of the strength of Ypsilanti's Black community, Ypsilanti, black, Ypsilanti's Black community was able to sue the city of Ypsilanti because of segregated schools in 1919, and they won and they desegregated the schools in Ypsilanti. Now, Ypsilanti resegregated the schools because what Ypsilanti said is, okay, we will no longer have schools based on uh, your race. They will just be based on where you live. Well, <laughs> guess where we all live. Okay, so uh, the breakthrough is April 1941. And that's an also key date for us here because that's when construction really begins at um, Willow Run, to create Willow Run. Willow Run was a, a big farming area, as, as the name implies. There was a run going through it. It was not great land for farming. There were some orchards over there. Henry Ford owned almost all of it, and what he did was use it as a kind of camp for um, uh, uh, young white kids from Detroit who needed to learn about farming and stuff. And they would come out here and work the fields for Henry and, and learn uh, about how to be a good farmer and a good stand-up American. And they even took American classes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, and, but I think it's important to remember, World War II, America enters World War II when? December 1941. Willow Run is built April 1941. It was not a surprise we were going to go to war. It was not a surprise. We knew it. We were preparing. In fact, one of the reasons we joined so late is because we're building up our armed forces, or the United States is building up its armed forces at the time. Now, here is what I consider the most, well, um, the most, one of the most important documents in, in the entire history of the labor movement in Michigan, and in the history uh, of black people in Michigan, because this is an open letter and it was uh, printed, you know, vote UAW CIO. It's after the strike wins at Ford in April 1941. And we're going to say a little bit about that. Uh, and then they're going to vote in the CIO then uh, after that. And this is a letter. And you'll notice some of the names on here are, well, there's John Conyers' father, right? There's there's Reverend Simmons from the uh, Hartford Memorial Baptist Church. And so the, and many of these people are closely associated with the Communist Party or the National Negro Congress. Uh, and they put out this open letter all over the city in the biggest black paper. It's a full page ad, open letter to Negro Ford workers about what the union might mean for them and what it has meant, as they say, to dance the bandana for Henry Ford all these years. And I had to look what that meant. <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a it's a Jim Crow phrase. 
this is a remarkable document. I urge everybody to take a look at it. Um, and But what it says, the, the clarity, the political clarity here is if we can beat Henry Ford, right, that means we can also beat the Black Legion, the racists behind Henry Ford. You know, it, it opens up the possibility for a much bigger campaign because one of the ways to think about how Henry Ford thought about Black people was, I think Henry Ford thought of himself as the world's best plantation organizer and overseer, right? And he was extraordinarily peeved at the fact that Black people in his factories voted for the CIO after he felt he had been so generous to them for so long. And he took it out on Black Detroit because after the vote uh, uh, in, I think it's June 1941, where uh, a majority of the Rouge plant votes in local uh, 600, Henry Ford stops all Black hiring at his plants. And in fact, there will not be a, a, a single Black hire at Willow Run for two more years. So Henry Ford felt aggrieved and he took it out on, on the Black working class here. And so what you know, one of the things we think about, why in the world is Henry Ford going to Kentucky for labor when there's all these black people here who are more than happy to work at a Henry Ford? Because because of that. Because of that. He he his feelings were hurt, King Henry. Okay, so then let's go into our timeline. Nothing is in our landscape by accident. Why do I call him King Henry? Look at where Washtenaw and Wayne County is. Here is the Willow Run plant. It's in Washtenaw County. Why is the plant where they produce things in Washtenaw County? So Henry Ford can pay taxes in the county he controls, which are dramatically lower than Wayne County run by the Democratic Party. You will see that even the line in the factory turns sharply at the county line. But why in the world then would he put the airport on the Wayne County line? Well, that's because he got a huge tax break for creating the Detroit Metropolitan Area Airport that also happened to be connected to his auto plant, right? So where the plant is and how it is laid out in the landscape is to benefit Mr. Ford, right? And so much like Ford Lake, so much of our landscape is to benefit Mr. Ford and the Ford Corporation. We are literally living in the world Henry built for better or worse. Uh, so March 1928, work begins on Willow Run. Oh, first, February 13th, 650 workers at Ypsilanti's United Stove win the UAW CIO contract. That is going to be in local 769. That is going to be the first black UAW officer in Ypsilanti is going to come out of 769. Uh, 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 1941, we begin the... Now, who builds, you know, the government builds the plant, right? 100 million taxpayers' dollars with then Henry Ford leasing the plant during the war with the agreement that Henry Ford would then buy the plant at the end of the war. Guess what Henry Ford didn't do at the end of the war, right? So the April 41 huge strike changes everything. So that means that whatever's going to happen at Willow Run is going to come under the UAW contract. It's going to come under a UAW auspices. Now, the the question is, which auspice? Will it come under the auspice of an existing uh, local? Will it create its own local? Will it be in receive, receivership by the national organization? And these are very tough questions because we're talking about what will become one of the largest union locals, let alone UAW locals in American history, right, where, where, where we'll grow to something like 70,000 members by the end of the war. And then if you add the people who, who, who left who are still members, we're talking about 100,000 people who went through local 50 of the UAW. So uh, uh, May 5th, 1941, the first Ypsilanti four plant UAW CIO meeting happens, and it happens at Riverside Park. A lot of these meetings will happen at Riverside Park. June 20th, the first board contract is um, um, signed. Uh, May 21st, the Ford generator plant, which is the plant you see off of off of uh, I-94, is voted in, and that was an AFL that becomes Local 849. Local 849 plays an incredible role in Ypsilanti history. Um, uh, 
uh, central specialty wins, uh, the largely black special, special central, uh, central specialty wins in June, Clarence Derrick would be elected. I'm sorry, Clarence Derrick of 782 is the first uh, uh, um, black uh, 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 UAW officer from Ypsilanti. And really importantly for uh, CIO in, in Washington all County, Trojan La uh, Laundry is organized by the UAW CIO Local 391, led by an absolute dynamite organizer, a black man named Ben Neely, who should, uh, who, who streets hopefully will someday be named after him. They tried to, the FBI tried to recruit him to be a stool pigeon. You can listen to a um, an oral history on the Ypsilanti District Library of him talking about his work. And he was the main CIO organizer for Black Ypsilanti, Ben Neely. And when Black women were uh, uh, told that they had to prove residency in the city to vote, in the 1942 election, Ben Neely went to the voting office with those black women and said, next time, if they don't vote, next time I'm coming with the CIO, right? The CIO gave you power. Those women were registered to vote that day. The CIO gave you power. So uh, August 41, we've got sewer, light, and uh, highway finally reaching the plant. September for, uh, the 1st, workers are hired in at first. Ford refuses to hire any women. So there's no Rosies. That's because men start going into the army. He needs to have women. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, no women, black or white. Labor shortages due to the draft, due to the racism of hiring, uh, uh, um, led uh, Henry Ford to do what he did not want to do, which is go through U.S. government agencies to get labor to come to Willow Run. And what he did was to go to Kentucky. He thought Kentucky would be the least union, most racist, most like least open to the communism that was in the air at the time. Um, and he is going to be in for the surprise of his life when these Kentuckians get out of the holler for the first time, start talking to each other and build one of the most radical unions in American history. Um, uh, uh, it's September 7th, 1941. So before the plant is even open is the first strike at uh, Willow Run. And there will be hundreds and hundreds of strikes at Willow Run. Nobody had control over that plant. So this is the environment we're, we're in, and this is what leads to the explosion that we will see. And by explosion, I mean explosion of violence. Um, you have a situation, so Black Ypsilanti cannot work at Willow Run and cannot work at the Ford plant that's in Ypsilanti, but they can work at Rouge Steel. So, so, but they can't live in Dearborn. They can only live in Ypsilanti, right? And then white folks might live in Dearborn, but can't work at Rouge Steel. They have to ride out to Ypsilanti to work at one of the village industries. So you've got not you, you've got where people work and where people live incongruous to each other. On top of that, you have masses <clears throat> masses of people moving into the city during the Depression when no new housing has been built over the last 15 years. And more than that, it is not possible in the conditions that were Detroit 1930 for a black neighborhood to grow because the growing of a black neighborhood would necessarily mean a white neighborhood being removed. So what you get is, that's why it's called a ghetto. You get people packed into Paradise Valley, Black Bottom, absolutely packed in, in, the, in you know, here in Ipsy, in that period, everybody is building apartments on top of their uh, garages. Everybody is building little cinder block shacks because there's such a housing crisis, and you can only if you're you can only move to a existing black neighborhood, and there's not going to be a development to create a new black neighborhood. So you've got a situation where people aren't working where they're living, aren't living where they're working, and are confined uh, uh, geographically to areas, including with things like walls and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things that that it, that Willow Run is, is proof of its kind of, uh, of the kind of work that was there is the huge labor turnover. Uh, uh, almost for every single person who walked in the front door, two walked out the back door. And that means you have to hire every day more people and more people and more people. Why was that? Why did people come all the way here to walk out of the back? Because it was a horrible place to 
to work. It, it, it was it was a hellish plant, right? I mean, it was the most technologically advanced plant ever created. And at the time, it was the largest plant in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and there wasn't air conditioning in it, right? You know, like it, it's hot. And, and Henry Ford had never built a plane before. And the whole thing was to get as many planes built as possible, as quickly as possible. And many, many times the U.S. military had to return the planes to Willow Run and say, you're going to get us all killed because this plane will crash. Redo it. Redo it. So for years, it took really years for that production to get up and running and in the way that we think of it now, where they were pumping out those planes and it was just working like a well. Oil. That's like the last six months of Willow Run. Before that, you couldn't keep somebody in the door, right? Um, uh, in January 42, there's 3,657 workers there. They are all white. They are all men. The first Ypsilanti UAW uh, Willow Run office opens at 32 North Washington, and, and there will not be a election for a local in Willow Run for another year or two. Uh, the UAW here will operate under the CIO of Washtenaw County. Um, uh, so 32 North Washington is up kind of like where Beezy's used to be. Um, the first woman hired into the plant is Agnes Menzi, and she's hired in as a nurse. Women earn 83 cents to a man's dollar in the plant. Now, the UAW's demand is equal pay for equal work. So why is that? Well, it's because the work isn't equal. Men do things like tool and die. Women do the more unskilled, less paid work. So even though men and women would get the same amount of pay for the same work, men and women are doing different work and, and, and men are, do, are doing the much higher paid work. Uh, but it is true that there was parity between men and women on the line. You, um, a woman made exactly what a man made. And that wasn't, <laughs> that was new. That was the union. That was new. Um, in February 1942, uh, three black women go to the Rouge hiring offices uh, 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 to, and they're refused. White women begin to be hired. Now, listen to what the UAW does. Now, remember, to organize Ford, they have to have black organizers. Uh, and, and for Willow Run, they want black organizers because they want black employees. They want Willow Run's workforce to look like, and this is UAW policy at the time, they want Willow Run's workforce to look like the, the population around it. So the, the demand is, by the UAW, the official demand is 7% black women, 12% black men, because that's the percentage in the workforce, right? Not the percentage of the population, but the percentage in the workforce. And what what Ypsilanti, what the what the CIO does with people like this wonderful man, uh, Reverend Henry J. Simmons, uh, he was the head of Brown Chapel. He, uh, he was a preacher, head of Brown Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, Paul Robeson's church. He was a member of the National Negro Congress. He hosted at Brown Chapel AME Black UAW meetings. He was vehement, as he said. Uh, I went to World War One and, and fought for democracy and came back to no democracy. That will not happen again. That's what Reverend uh, Simmons said. And he was a major force in Ypsilanti at the time, creating a coalition with the UAW, with the NAACP, with the Communist Party, uh, and with the Urban League to challenge these and other left-wing organizations. Everybody here should not be surprised. We are talking about the 30s and 40s. Many of the activists we're talking about were members of organized socialist or communist organizations. There would have been no UAW without them. It is just the fact. Uh, and many of them will play a leading role in Ypsilanti. That will change dramatically under McCarthyism, uh, and we will see it here in Ypsilanti. But the fact is many of the people who built the UAW, including in Ypsilanti, were either in or around various socialist and communist movements. And that's kind of what gave them their long-term perspective, the long-term goal. So here you see the actual numbers of people employed in the plant, and you see black listed here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We get black men in uh, 1942, August of 1942, black men begin to not be hired into the plant, but transferred from the Rouge into the plant. And again, we don't see any black women until December of 1942, and then it's only eight. And what happens is that black women, black women begin to sit in. 
the the civil rights movement that we think of that happened in the 50s and 60s in Michigan, the most potent civil rights movement that changed how we work and live in the state. It changed laws in the state happened during World War Two. It was not it was it was early. And I think we need to recognize that World War Two was a moment of the civil rights movement. Black uh, uh, black radicals said that we are fighting for the double V victory against fascism in Europe, victory against fascism at home, the double V. And we'll see that here. So uh, you begin. So you get mass demonstrations. Ten thousand people march on against Jim Crow at Detroit's Cadillac Square. Again, black uh, uh, women are trying to get into the plant. Ford, in May 1942, decides for the first time ever in his life that he's going to listen to his workers, and he goes to the Ford plant and he says, "You know, I can't hire any black women because." The Rosies working there now, they, they say they won't work next to black women. So I'm going to have to listen to them, right, the first time ever. And in fact, we know that that's in part not true. Uh, certainly there was, there were, there were racist strikes in Willow Run, including mainly around the use of common bathroom facilities, unfortunately. And white women did strike against having to use um, uh, uh facilities with black women. The UAW came in and said, anybody who does that will no longer be a member of the UAW. They made a racist strike incompatible with membership of the UAW. Uh, now, how many people got get got booted because of that? I don't know. But uh, it was an important statement. Like, for example, you could not, the Klan was big in Detroit in the 20s and 30s. The, it was, you could simply not be a member of the Klan and be a member of the UAW. So the UAW really was a kind of bulwark defending democracy uh, in this area um, and, uh, and demanding more democracy. So housing hell, because you have tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of people move. Now, again, we'll, we'll look at the numbers, but Ypsilanti is about 14,000 people uh, uh, in 1939. There, there's going to be 50,000 people just working in that plant in a couple of years, right? Uh, and one of the issues is what are we going to do about housing? Now, a whole bunch of people, black people and white people are moving in from the south and other areas to come to Ypsilanti area, uh, which is a solidly Republican county. And the real estate developers and the city council and Henry Ford are absolutely adamant. Not a single home will be built for you. Not a single. You can come up here and work, but you're going to have to live in a shack. And you're seeing how people are living. So we had housing hell, like all of the fields in Superior Township. People were camping out. People are working at the largest factory in the world and they don't have running water. And the issue is largely that the powers that be here want to several things. There's no money to be made in public housing and housing for poor people. Two, that's going to completely upset who votes where and when. And one of the things to, to show I'm not lying or I'm, I'm not making this up, I want to read this. And this is from the, the time. This is a, 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 a letter to the editor of Labor Age newspaper, which was a socialist newspaper at the time. It says, dear editor, every intelligent person knows what Henry Ford is like. He is a malicious empty Semite who in the past at least supported Father Coughlin, has had militant unionists be beaten up, uh, and his secret police has received a medal from Hitler. Now it seems that he is trying to sabotage a UA-advocated housing project to be located next to his Detroit plant for the workers who have to travel to work. Here are some of the facts as presented by Helen Fuller in the current issue of the New Republic as why that is. So uh, uh, um, it happens that Edsel Ford's brother-in-law is the prominent uh, uh, representative with the uh, uh, local um, uh, um, uh, organization that deals with migration. Uh, at the same time, Ford's attorney has begun persuading the Truman Committee that the Bomber City Housing Project was a great waste of materials. So why all of these things? Well, she gives... Four reasons. One, political. Ford wants to keep Washtenaw County, where the project is located, safely Republican for Republican Earl Michener, his pal. The section which houses many Ford executives, including Henry, Harry Bennett, is dominated by Ford's political friends, among whom are the Ku Klux Klan. 
Cochlanites and the Young Republicans organized and controlled by Ford and allied with the Minnesota Strasserites. That's a fascist group called the Silver Shirts. Trade union. Henry Ford does not want the thousands of militant UAW workers living together. That may create too much solidarity and friendship for Ford's health and pocketbook. Three, post-war planning. Ford wants to keep the price of land down so that after the war, he can buy it back up cheap. And this is actually true. If anybody knows about Henry, he was crazy about soybeans. Soybeans. Henry wants the land to continue the experiment with soybeans, which he intends to substitute for steel in making automobiles after the war. So these are common People are commonly talking about this. And meanwhile, people are living in these shacks. So what in the world are we going to do about it? What we do then is we really see the UAW come into its own. And we see the UAW become a civic social union, where in this region and under the leadership of Local 50, it will take on every concern of its members, whether it's in the plant, whether it's at school, whether it's at home, whether it's in the election box, wherever. And uh, because nobody else is stepping in. So the UAW steps up and creates education, health programs, demands housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and within that process, Black women uh, begin to organize the Carver Center um, because Black women are going to work, and now somebody needs to take care of black women's children, traditionally the job of black women, right? Uh, and so we get we get named after George Washington Carver. We get uh, black Ypsilanti organizing for services. And I think it's extremely important to remember that the black Ypsilanti is that those services, they're demanding not be segregated. And to ensure they're not segregated, they do not want those services located on the south side of Ypsilanti. They want them located on Michigan Avenue, where they know white people will also use them, and therefore they will not be starved of funding, right? So the demand is not for uh, a black social hall, the Park Ridge Community Center. The demand is not for black uh, a, a black housing development. The demand is for full access to the housing that you're going to build and all of that. And in the absence of that full access, we want as much control over our situation as possible. We want a black director. We want a black architect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as women are coming into the plant, Henry Ford is faced with a situation. And I think here we're going to get to one of those huge myths. Now, everybody has seen the iconic photo, which is actually a Westinghouse, or not photo, uh, image, which is actually a Westinghouse, please work harder uh, a piece of propaganda that they put up in their factory. But it became a symbol for lots of different reasons of women's power, of women in the workforce, of, 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 of feminism, right? That, that we can do it. We can do it. Well, let's unpack that myth a little bit. None of the men in Willow Run were forced to wear those coveralls. Only the women, and they had to buy them. And here we can see them walking in here to get their coveralls and look at their faces, and they have to buy them themselves. Why is that? Because Henry Ford and Harry Bennett are concerned that if women are working next to men on the line, the curves of women will be distracting to men. So they want to cover those curves. I tell no lie. They want to cover those curves, right? So the men aren't distracted by the women. Now, I'm sure some people here have worked in an auto plant. Do you wear loose fitting clothing, <laughs> cover all loose fitting clothing on the line? It's actually quite dangerous. There's plenty of places in the plant where you might do that, uh, but the line is not one of them, right? And so this remarkable woman, Louise Stabler, who's a single mom, she's uh, a, a member of the Socialist Party, she works on the plant and she uh, gets elected frequently, including in some slates to, to high positions in local 50. She goes by the name of Redhead, Louise Stabler. Uh, and the let's, let's get the exact date, uh, August 15th, 1942, 26 women are sent home for wearing uh, improper attire, meaning they refuse to wear Henry Ford's outfit. Uh, the women wildcat working at the plant. And they win the ability to wear their own clothes on the line. So when you see photos of Willow Run, here are the women. They're not wearing those much 
respected and vaunted coveralls. Why? Because those were slave coveralls from Henry Ford. And union women weren't going to wear Henry Ford's uniform. They were going to be treated with respect like the men and wear their own clothes. So if you want to honor those Rosies, wear your civilian clothes because they went on strike to demand to not be treated as lesser than men. And those outfits were lesser than men, right? They sexualized those women and they made them lesser. Now, uh, uh, in October 1942, 30,000 Detroit area women are working in war plants. Less than 100 of them are black. We have an issue here of a deeply segregated, not, not even segregated, War industries are simply cut off to large numbers of black workers. And uh, that with the housing crisis creates this, this movement, a social movement to change all of that. Uh, and so we're going to get a massive struggle, you know, the double V. So look at these pictures. I, I like these pictures because we can see winter, summer, fall, right? This is a movement going on for a long time. Ford's refusal to hire women, Negro women, undemocratic. There's one in, oh, here, I like this. Hitler is in uh, down uh, 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 with Ward, employees stooge. Ward was a, a U of M black football player who became uh, head of human relations for Ford's, for black workers from Ford. Hitler is in Germany and Bennett is in the Rouge. So they're literally making the connection between Hitler and Germany and Harry Bennett and the Rouge, right? They're fighting against those same things. And, and you'll notice white workers here. These are radical UAW members who are going on strike and fighting to end discrimination in their plants. Many of them are communists and socialists, but many of them are just solid union people, right? You do see white people here. Uh, and that's what creates this dynamic situation. Uh, this is the Reverend from Hartford Memorial Baptist Church, who is the leading black figure for the UAW in this period. He's a remarkable figure. You can see these, the, how Detroit was seen, right, across the country for aid and comfort to the enemy. In Detroit, it's Jim Crow town, right? Uh, for jobs and justice, March on Washington. So in 1943, A. Philip Randolph wanted to march on Washington to demand jobs and justice. Does anybody remember when the jobs and justice march ha finally happened? It's really famous because there was an I have a dream speech. This march for jobs and justice was supposed to happen in 1943, and it was delayed and delayed and delayed, and the exact same term for jobs and justice was the uh, 1963 March on Washington. So it comes out of the civil rights movement during World War II. So wildcat strikes. I don't have time to go into all of this. Just to let you know that the myth of everybody putting away their differences, putting their wheel to the grindstone, not complaining and beating the Nazis is an absolute myth. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of strikes from five people to a thousand people, from 50 to 100. The UAW had a no strike pledge during this period which means all of these are wildcat strikes, which means these are workers taking it on their own initiative. To give you a sense of how little control management had of this plant, the, the people who were the test pilots for the bombers struck because the company tried to take their beer rations away that they were drinking while test piloting. <laughs> All right. So that's how much control the human resources had of this plant. It was a free for all. And often, you know, a strike in a plant like this where everything runs to schedule, a strike of 40 people in one department may shut down the entire plant. Right. OK, so uh, uh, let's move up as we go. Right. Local 50 moves to its new headquarters. Local 50 is now uh, codified. They have their first elections. We'll, we'll go through the different slates of Local 50. And if you ever go to Water Street, right across from on Michigan Avenue, right across from the car dealership in downtown Ypsilanti, that's where Local 50 was headquartered. In my mind, one of the most important, I mean, it was short-lived, 43 to 47, more or less, uh, um, but it was one of the most important leaders uh, 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 in the entire trade union movement. And they would lead a left-wing insurgency within the UAW itself against the no-strike pledge during World War II. Uh, 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 then we, again, we get that black Ypsilanti union coalition, which becomes 
absolutely centered to Ypsilanti public life for the next 40 or 50 years. Um, again, we see a, another year long uh, a, a campaign, but we also see that it's not just fighting these civil rights. People are providing things like the UAW local baseball club, right? Um, uh, people are providing uh, all kinds of uh, institutions that didn't exist before for working people that they controlled for the first times in their lives. It changes everything. There wasn't a working person ever on Ypsilanti City Council before World War II. You had to be the, the son of a mill owner or the grandson of a mill owner to, or own the auto company, right? You, there wasn't a working person. In 1942, 43, we start to see union members get elected. And, and you know, it got pretty hard after that to get voted into Ypsilanti without being a union member for some years. Local 50 starts the workers' college at the, the dorms. Now, what happens is that the, how, the housing is, that there is a breakthrough that federal, the, the local people won't do it, the private developers won't do it, but the federal government is now going to step in and build housing. But they're going to build Willow Run as an all-white housing complex. And then they're going to build Park Ridge on the south side of Ypsilanti as an all-black uh, uh, um, uh, housing development. Now, something extraordinary happens, which is while they are building that, the UAW is literally picketing the building of houses for its own members because they will be segregated. They are trying to stop the building of houses for themselves because they are segregated, which is, that's solidarity. <laughs> that's solidarity. Um, and so what happens is, Federal law will change. And what happens by late 1943, FDR and this campaign and Thurgood Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice, comes to Ypsilanti to help lead the campaign. They will change federal law. And it means that you can no longer have in federal housing and federal industry racial practices. So Willow Run, built for all white people, will become open to black tenants. Now, it will be internally segregated. If people know Willow Run, the Clay Hill section is in the north. But what I find so remarkable, because it's public housing, that Willow Run is built for only white people. And because of the civil rights movement that happened during World War II, it meant that Willow Run is the only place in suburban Washington County open to black people after World War II. A black person is not going to get be able to go into any subdivision in Washtenaw County and get a house, except Willow Run. Why? It is federal housing. And, and, and when federal housing is taken away, the black community of Willow Run in 1954 has to fight to stay in those homes as the area is privatized. So they had to fight again. And Willow Run is also the place where there would have been the last uh, property qualifications to vote on the school board. And since everybody lived in federal housing, nobody was a property owner, so could not vote on the school board for their children. So the Willow Run Tenants Association pulled pennies together, bought an acre of swamp land, and all claimed to be property owners so they could vote in an election for their children's school. That's the kind of barriers being placed in, in front of a uh, uh, working class Ypsilanti. June 1943, many of you will know this, Detroit explodes in a pogrom, uh, largely of uh, uh, white working class people attacking isolated black neighborhoods. Um, it was... Uh, when we think of so-called race riots today, uh, it, the generally the impression is a black community rising up against police oppression or, or, or something like that. Uh, in 1943, when you talked about a race riot, you meant white people pulling black people off buses, and killing, right? And that's what happened in Detroit. Martial law is declared in Detroit. The same time that U.S. troops, U.S. Marines are fighting in Southeast, uh, uh, in the Pacific, on the islands in the Pacific, they're patrolling Detroit. Dozens of people were killed in those riots. Uh, if there had not been a UAW in Detroit during World War II, I shudder to think of the consequences. Whatever the issues, and there are many, and I don't want to paint too rosy a picture of the UAW, but I genuinely think that it was the UAW that stood between us 
and some very, very, very ugly, uh, uglier than what we're seeing here, which is ugly enough. Some very ugly, uh, truly horrific kind of moments. Uh, the, the picture on the bottom left, I do want, um, because I think it's bis been misidentified. These are actually two people helping this man to safety. And there's a whole story about uh, 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 about these men. These people are clearly not helping anybody to safety, right? Uh, one interesting thing about the Detroit, the the riots that happened in Detroit is the National Guard of Ypsilanti is sent to Detroit. The National Guard of Ypsilanti was sent to Detroit in the 1863 race riot. The National Guard of Ypsilanti was sent to Detroit in the 1967 race riots, right? So this is a white community whose National Guard goes to police black Detroit often. The other thing is that, uh, and I hope this punctures our arsenal of democracy notion, because of what happened in June 1943, for the rest of World War II, Ypsilanti banned all Fourth of July demonstrations and parades. So in the arsenal of democracy, a stone's throw from Willow Run, you could not celebrate the founding of the nation for fear that it would turn into a race riot. That was from 43 to 45. I hope that challenges some of our notion about what that war looked like here. Okay, um, I want to actually, uh, well, we went through some, the riots here and Local 50, and I wanna get in to um, just some of the policies as, as we move through this. So just look at what the UAW was involved in. We've got recreational programs, men and women. We've got sports classes, dancing every, you know, every Friday, bowling leagues are, are organized. The third party is to be favored. The, the UAW Local 50 attempted to create the Washtenaw County Commonwealth Party as a third pro-labor independent political party. Willow Run children get Halloween party, voters in six day drive. The UAW, this is why Henry Ford was scared. The UAW hit a record 3,000, registered a record 3,445 new voters in Willow Run in a single day, right? That means that they can now change who's elected to city council. Union will sponsor dance this evening. Refusal to incorporate Willow Run. So why did they refuse to incorporate Willow Run as a village when it most clearly is a village? To this day, Willow Run is not a municipality. Willow Run would be a majority black city in Washtenaw County. That's what it would be. And, well, I think I answered the question. Okay, uh, uh, more timeline. I love these, these general uh, uh, membership meetings. Um, this is the period uh, where the UAW really steps into its own. The first couple of years uh, during the war, it's as you can tell, it's hodgepodge. It's it, nobody has any control over anything. But the inst also the UAW is growing dramatically, not just in Washington County, but all around the country. And so the UAW, and also of course the war, the the government is in is in more or less a, an alliance, a working relationship with the union. So. You know, there is a kind of popular front. Uh, we're allied with the Soviet Union at the time, which is really important, right? So Henry Ford would be totally anti-Soviet. The communists would be pro-Soviet. So the communists actually seemed a lot more patriotic and pro-war than Henry Ford did. That's how confusing the situation got, right? And also the communists, because they were trying to support the defense of the Soviet Union, which had been invaded by Nazi Germany in the summer of 1941, that they did not want any reduction in military uh, production because that would be to defend the Soviet Union. So the the communists in the UAW were vehement supporters of the no strike pledge, which got them into trouble with some more and also with dampening down in the later part of the years on demands for civil rights, which got them into trouble with some of their own base and radicals. Right. And so you see, uh, I'm going to go back to that and go to this. You see, here are the different, we have three different um, slates within UAW Local 50. The, the first, uh, June 1941 is when Ford accepts the UAW. So workers will be uh, uh, um, um, organized under the UAW. 
So the first slate that wins in the election is June 43. So that's the first time there's so it's two years without an election. Local 50 will get its own officers. And Glenn Brayton wins for the good for the union uh, slate. This war will be fought in vain if every man does not have decent food, clothing, and housing. He's tied to the UAW national leadership and very tied to the local 600 leadership. Now, the United Bomber Workers slate uh, uh, wins the next election, and that's led by Walter Quillico. Uh, and he's, a commun he's in the Communist Party leadership. Another important figure in that is this man named, uh, and again, Communists are winning elections in UAW Local 50, which has a membership of 50,000 people, many of them from Kentucky, right? I just want to underline this reality we're working with here. Uh, Frank Seymour, right here, he is education director for Local 50, and he will become the first black man anywhere in Michigan to be elected to city council. Uh, and it is on the virtue of his organizing the UAW and those services. Uh, uh, he's also instrumental in Park Ridge. The other person who's extremely important in this process is Olga Madar, the first head of the Congress of Labor Union Women, and I believe the first female vice president of the UAW. I could be wrong about that, but I believe she is. Uh, so Ypsilanti uh, punches above its weight in Clue. There are two women from small little Ypsilanti auto plants who end up becoming uh, heads of Clue, and I'll, I'll, you'll meet the next one in a moment. The, then, because of that, United Bomber Workers Communist Party pledge, the No Strike Pledge, Wage Controls, Arbitration Courts, you can see how active and many strikes are going on here, and also people are starting to get very worried about what's coming after the war. Will the plant be kept open? Will we all be shut down? And so what you see is a really left-wing slate called the Rank-and-File Slate, led by this man named Brendan Sexton, who actually will become a top figure in the Ruther. Um, he's a member of the Socialist Party, but he will become a, a top figure in the Ruther regime in the 50s. Uh, uh, he wins. And uh, that Louise Stabler, who we saw before, Red, who led the Wildcat against Wary, she wins in that as well. And Frank actually moves over to the rank and file slate. <laughs> uh, so, so, so these are the slates. So we have competition. We have we have, and then the last slate is the one then that leads at the, in, I believe it's in Grand Rapids in uh, 1945. There's a UAW convention where they, the local 50 leads the rebellion against the no strike pledge. Okay, here's federal housing. This is what it looked like. This is where Clay Hill was. This is what it looked like there. One of the things that's interesting about this map, you see two schools, right? Here's the black area. So which school would black people go to? Well, this Ross school is closer, but you would have to walk through a white community. So they made the black school Simmons School. Again, things are not in our landscape by accident. They mean things. They mean who has power, who doesn't, who's in control, who isn't. Bottom uh, right here, this is the Federal War Housing Project at Park Ridge on the south side of Ypsilanti. This federal war housing is all demolished by the early 1950s. When did the black federal wars, war housing get demolished? 2020. People lived in it until 2020. Okay, um, so at, we're coming to the end of our, our, our story. And so the issue is we have tens of thousands of people who have left their homes, who have started new lives, who have moved to this area, who have waged not just a struggle with the powers that be for rights and for services, but have built an organization which they can be proud of, which has which literally will make their children's lives better, right? This is, this is something profound people have done, but they are expendable. They are expendable. As, as before the war is even over, before the war is even over, there are mass layoffs at the at the um, uh, at the plant. So the UAW begins picketing of the manpower office and demanding relief for the nearly 90,000 war workers already laid off. So when we talk about deindustrialization in Michigan, it began immediately at the end of World War II. Immediately at the end of World War II, you get a contraction of people working in industry and in auto. 
So, uh, you know, it's not 67. It's not the Reagan years. I mean, all of those did happen, but it begins in the summer of 1945. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, when uh, Willow, uh, in early 1945, well, let's say late 1944, there will be about 35 or 40,000 people working at Willow Run um, when Kaiser Fraser reopens it uh, 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 in the mid 1940s. There will be about 10,000 working there. When GM reopens it in 1953, there will be about 7,000 working there. So, you know, it keeps getting ratcheted down and that would continue up until the final closing of the plant. So the issue is then what to do with Willow Run. Henry Ford has decided to walk away in part, and we know this because it's in a newspaper, his Dearborn Independent, in part because Frank uh, uh, and some local communists have won election in Ypsilanti City Council, and we don't have control there anymore. And part of him is just his attitude towards black, and he's walking away. He's also very old, and there is a division within the Ford empire, and Harry Bennett is losing out to Edsel, and Edsel is a much different character. Than, than, than Bennett and, and daddy or granddaddy. Um, so literally, uh, 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 Henry Ford said it is, as, or I think it was Ed, Edsel Ford said, Willow Run is, no, Ford did, is as expendable as a battleship. Now think about what that says. When a battleship goes down, people die. I mean, think about the callousness of that. Think about the callousness of, of that. So the last bomber is produced in June 28th. On July 2nd, office workers, mainly women and members of the United's office, professional local CIO, they strike against Local 50 <laughs> because they're about to get laid off. So we got to strike by the employees of Local 50 against Local 50. And so the demand of the Local 50, the first demand, and they go to Ruther with this, and Ruther actually agrees with it. I don't know how strongly he agreed with it, but the first demand is that the federal government open the plant to create buses and public transportation. Can you imagine if the largest plant in the Western Hemisphere, instead of making cars after World War II, made buses and public transportation, how that might have shifted our society? Okay, that is rejected. Second offer, that the UAW itself buy the plant. Ruther claims to have agreed with that. Uh, um, uh, the government, because they own the plant, it's being leased, are going to be the final arbitrator. And the government gives the plant to Kate, Kaiser Frazier. And these are uh, war profiteers who made ships uh, in the Bay Area, Richmond, shipyards, etc. And they're going to open a, the Kaiser Frazier plant. The problem is the UAW doesn't want Local 50 in control of that plant. The federal government doesn't want Local 50 in control of that plant, and you can sure bet Kaiser Fraser doesn't want one of the most left-wing militant locals in the country in control of that plant. So you get a concerted effort to, to decertify. What happens is it end up, ends up Local 50 is decertified, and uh, union recognition is given to the locals from the Bay Area. Right. Not even locals around here. The old Kaiser Fraser locals from the Bay Area that built the plants, uh, built the um, uh, ships during the war. They're given control over over the plant, not Local 50. Uh, so this and, and then we're going to move into the Cold War. But look at the bottom. Willow Run, the workers there tried to prevent uh, Ford from removing uh, the factory machines from the factory. There was a 16-mile picket line around Willow Run trying to prevent machinery from leaving every single exit. That's the level people were going to. My husband is not expendable. We got four kids, cutback casualty, right? So uh, there was a tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 fight to do that. Now, that failed, and Kaiser Fraser became... Um, uh, an important fixture, and then later GM. And I will say that um, um, Kaiser Fraser hired so many people, Black people who say, I worked at Willow Run, they mean they worked when Kaiser Fraser began hiring because the UAW was, that that was not going to happen again in Southeast Michigan. You're going to, in a Ford, in, in, in a local 600 area, Black people are getting hired. End of story. 
um, and, and black people are going to be part of the leadership of the union. So that did change. And but that what happened at Willow Run changes everything. Because look at this guy. This is the, this is Riverside Arts Center. This is the Masonic Temple. Union gives you power. The janitor, one guy, he's the only member of this bargaining unit, is on strike against the Masonic Temple. And he can do that because he has a union behind him, right? And he's seen what people can do. And he has faith in himself and his and 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 what they've been able to accomplish. The CIO strikes again. It's a strike of 80 city employees shut down Ypsilanti Municipal Gas. Workers strike uh, uh, at EMU. There's a reason why EMU has a uh, UAW, a uh, large UAW bargaining uh, uh, unit. And it goes all the way back to this. So. And then the first black elected officials are also come out of this tradition. Let's think about this. One of the amazing things in 1930, in 1939, there were about a hundred CIO members in Washtenaw County. By 1954, over 60% of the workforce in Washtenaw County is unionized. That is absolutely, it's one of the most unionized places in the United States. And that is because of the weight of the CIO at Willow Run and the ripple effect into every, everybody got unionized after that. Everybody got unionized. As late as 1989, Ypsilanti and the township had 13 UAW locals with 50% of workers working in manufacturers. Manufacturing leaders of local 50 become regional leaders uh, um, uh, uh, across the country. Black political power. Here's the new alderman. Here's Frank Seymour elected. He says this is he's the first black man elected anywhere in Michigan to city council. He's a UAW local 50 education director, probably a member of the Communist Party or fellow traveler. I wish to take this opportunity to thank each and every citizen uh, 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 of the city who supported me in Monday's election. This is a victory for the working man. I will do my best to fulfill your hopes and expectations. A milestone in the democratic progress has been achieved for the common man. I have just begun to fight. Now, I, I do need to say what happens to Frank Seymour. Uh, he went through a radical phase in his year, early period, clearly, and union period. Um, he took his many, many skills to Barry Gordy's Motown Records, where he became head of public relations for Barry Gordy's Motown Records, and then started his own PR firm. And he is the man you can thank or not for targeting Newport cigarettes to black people. Is Frank Seymour. So he actually has an extraordinary life that, that somebody needs to write a book about. This is Eula Tate. She is the second woman from Little Ypsilanti, about 16,000 people, to head the Congress of Labor Union Women. She is the uh, president of the Belleville plant. Uh, she was honored on the floor of the uh, Cong U.S. Congress. Um, uh, uh, and she unfortunately died too young. Um, um, but she was also a top leader of the UAW. The first black mayor of Ypsilanti is John H. Burton. He is education director of Local 60 or Local 600 and comrades with Coleman Young. In uh, 1967, there are, there are seven uh, majority white cities in the entire United States with black mayors, okay? Seven majority white cities in the entire United States with black mayors. One of them is in Ypsilanti. In fact, three of them are in Michigan. And if I tell you those three, you will go, well, that's the UAW because it's Flint, it's Saginaw, and it's Ypsilanti. The UAW brought black people to political power in this state. There is Coleman Young. He is exactly part of this story. In fact, I'm sure all of these, uh, not her because she's of a different generation, but these three men, I'm sure that they had a, a cold one and discussed these issues. Uh, right. So that that was really key. At the end, all of this progress we are going to make in, during World War Two in this massive civil rights movement, which changes federal law, it changes local law, it changes where people live and work, it changes the opportunities people have. Much of that is going to be reversed in the uh, McCarthy period. So this man you see here is a local 50 leader, Tommy Dennis. Major, he's, his family still lives on South Adams Street. His family, he's, he's old. It's, they've been in this community for many years. He and his sister, Anna Dennis, were leaders of the Young Comrades. 
and the Carver and Park Ridge Community Center had a communist youth group attached to it called the Young Comrades. And when he is on trial for trying to overthrow the government in 1953 and under the Smith Act, and he will go to prison, uh, one of the things that they charge him with as his nefarious deeds during the war is he built a playground for local children at the Park Ridge Community Center. Clearly the man was dangerous. He was clearly dangerous. Tommy Dennis becomes a major figure in the party, and he will actually be a um, editor of People's Weekly World and died not that long ago. And I understand that his wife is actually still alive. Uh, and then we're going to end with these looks at the landscape. So before Willow Run, after Willow Run. I don't think I can say anything more dramatic than that. We have a farming community on the outskirts of a small industrial town turned into a suburb of Detroit with one of the largest factories on planet Earth pumping out emissions next to it, right? We, we, the Ypsilanti of 1940 and the Ypsilanti of 1960 are two entirely different things. In 1939, Michigan had 79 UAW locals and 110,000 members. In 1949, it had 299 locals and 463,000 members in Michigan, meaning the UAW is by far, by a magnitude of much, the largest membership organization in Michigan history and deserves to be treated as such as one of the most important social movements in our state's history, one that we cannot understand Ypsilanti without understanding that tradition. And I will leave it there. I truly appreciate everybody hanging in for that long haul. And if anybody would like, maybe at least we can turn on the um, sound if anybody has some chats or questions. Feel free to drop it in the chat box if you want as well. I'll be paying attention to that. Well, I appreciate everybody coming on and sticking through all of that. Um, I hope you have a, a better sense of what happened here. I think it helps to make make better sense of, of what, how we live today, how we live today. And also, uh, we have a tradition here. We have a wonderful tradition here to pull on to. And, um, and, and we're doing ourselves a disservice by not pulling on to it. Okay, everyone. I thank you so much. If there's no questions, I deeply appreciate this. Uh, uh, you showing up. And did, were we able to share the PDF? Yes. Okay. So the PDF is out there. Thank yep, you very I much. And I look forward to hearing times. you at the next talk. Yes. Frank is. Yes. Uh, uh, it changed over time. It changed over time. Uh, and, and many of the issues were extremely local. That 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 changed that, you know, who supported the no strike pledge and who didn't. OK, thank you all so much.